Time to talk technology this week and some of the news that's coming around. Matthew Dickerson, a very good morning to Yeah, morning, you. Nick. Good to see you again. You and I have chatted about drones before, and we've talked about just how they're a bit of fun. We've even looked at the way they're being used out at solar farms as a bit of a helping workers there. But this might be the first drone I've heard of saving a life. Yeah, and there are probably other examples where drones may have saved a life in a, an obscure or abstract way, but this is a direct reflection of the work that a drone was doing. There was a, a young child, very young, five, six years of age, and he went missing, and his parents obviously very concerned. He hadn't come home from school. People noticed him on the school bus. He got off and maybe took a wrong turn. They weren't really sure. Next thing you know, the police are in action, and the community came in action. 600 people in the community were out looking for him. And, and so that was obviously fantastic to see the community rally behind, but it wasn't actually producing any results. The FBI got called in. So the big guns were there. Everyone was looking, and there was a local photographer who had drones as part of his armoury of, of various utilities and he also had a new little tool, a new little fun thing that he was playing with, with a heat map drone or heat map camera on his drone. So he thought maybe I can help here and he went out and flew that around and he saw this incredible lineup of 600 people in a big line just going forward a metre at a time and he thought well I, no point going behind there, I'll go in front of there and he went in front of there and about two kilometres in the, the distance he saw two little spots and I saw the video of it and I went, wow, he's pretty good if he can spot that and turn, <laughs> turn that into a person and a dog. But he, he actually got the police to search there and sure enough, there was a little boy curled up on the ground with his dog right beside him there and, and I think, as harsh as it sounds, probably curled up to die because the temperature overnight got to minus one degree. So you can imagine for a little child, kindergarten sort of age child, being out overnight, all night, at minus one degree Celsius, then they're not going to be real healthy the next day. Not at all, and terrified as well. And yeah. I, I think what blew my mind was learning that this was a commercially available drone. Because the, right. the minute I read that headline, I'm like, well, that's got to be some very high-tech army kind of action there. That's but right. no, it's just something commercially available. Well, when I saw the FBI coming, I thought, oh, they've brought their drone in. They've brought all their super-duper technology in. But no, it was just someone who does some aerial photography for various people, just a, a local photographer who thought he could help out. And yeah, he was pretty happy to be able to help out. And obviously the family were over the moon ecstatic that he was able to help out. And look, I think it reflects what we're seeing more and more is the idea of drone technology being brought into that first responder. You know, we've seen surf life-saving drones that can drop a um, automated defibrillator off if they need to, or even a um, inflatable life raft when they're required. Yeah. We've seen uh, experimentation of drones being used for blood deliveries and medical deliveries. And it's just kind of get with it because this is happening now, isn't it? I think it's really just limited by your imagination. What else can we do with a drone? And a drone obviously has the advantage that A, it can go point to point, so it's not constrained to roads, and B, it's very quick and easy to get it going. If you want to get a, a rescue helicopter going, you've got to go to somewhere where the helicopter can take off and, and follow a whole range of regulations with the FAA. But in this case, it's just a drone, put what you want on it, off you go. So it's very quick and very easy to get launched, and it can go straight to where it's needed. Look, while we're talking about technology saving lives, on a very different angle, perhaps, I don't often associate the Vatican with high tech, but they've come up with something a little unusual. I really like the idea that the Vatican, the Catholic Church, is saying we've got to get with it to stay in touch with our younger generations that are coming through. So they've brought out an e-rosary. And effectively, it's a bracelet. I would have loved to have ordered one to be able to show you here today, Nick. But I couldn't <laughs> get it in time. I would love to see one. Christmas present. <laughs> and so it's an e-rosary, and it's got 10 beads around it. And you can wear it around your wrist, but it links to an app. So on the app, you can choose the type of rosary that you want to say. And then as you move your fingers along the e-rosary, the e a normal rosary, and I don't know how many I should, I'm a good Catholic boy, but I should know how many beads around a normal rosary, but you follow around the whole rosary to say your nirvana or whatever you might be saying. Whereas this just has the, the one ten loop that you go around, but because it links to the app, you can actually see where you are up to in your rosary. So you, you probably, at some stage in the future, and this isn't in the app yet, but you'll probably get points or awards <laughs> for certain rosaries. So. Well, this is what people have been suggesting, is it's going to end up being a Fitbit for prayer, almost similar. It's exactly right. So, again, I love the idea that it is that, that church trying to stay modern and progressive. I mean, I, I just... I'm not sure who's going to go and use this because the people that I know that say the rosary probably aren't using smartphones. No. So they're trying to appeal to that newer audience. Maybe it's something for down the track. But I just love the idea that it's trying to stay in touch with the, the younger generation. Well, I just hope they keep up to date with it because I've got a sense that it'll sell really, really well. But if they're not keeping that kind of development cycle going <laughs> on it, people will get disappointed very quickly. So I hope the Vatican's ready. Yeah, well, who knows? There's someone <laughs> in there that's probably thought this is a great <laughs> idea. So I want to see their sales after a few months' time and see I'll how many they've sold. Very 
very, very curious to see that. Look, finally, let's talk about email because this was interesting and counterintuitive to me. Banning out of hours email could actually harm employee wellbeing. How on earth do you come to that conclusion? I think the general conclusion I come to from having read this story is that it's all about horses for courses. So some people can't switch off. They go home and their boss says to them, I want you to stop touching your email Take overnight. a break. Take a break. In France, there's actually legislation around the email after hours and the, the work that's required by some organisations in relation to your email. So there's actually legislation to try and make people have a break. I didn't know that. Yeah, so this is interesting though, whereas some people get more stressed by the fact that they can't touch their email. So they go home, they've got a big project on at the moment, they're trying to get it finished, and then, oh, what? I've been told I can't touch my email, and they sit there all night worrying about that email they've got to send off, thinking about it, so they can get in the next morning and get that email sent off. And so I think, really, there are some people who need to have a break, and an enforced break is a good idea. And other people are sensible enough to be reasonable with it, but they just want to do things in their own time. They don't want to go home a bit early, see their kids, have dinner with their kids, and then at 9 o'clock at night, rather than sit down and watch some mindless show on TV, actually sit there and do a bit of email work then. And, and see, I think for that, that's okay, and that keeps people feeling a bit relaxed. We know that when people come in on Monday mornings, there's a lot of emails sitting oh, there yeah. waiting for them, and, and scammers try and take advantage of that and try and target people on Monday mornings. So some people like to just get there on a Sunday night, sit down, clean out their inbox, so they come in on Monday and they feel relaxed and stress-free, ready to start the week without a chock block inbox. So for some people it works, for some people it doesn't. So again, I think these studies show that you can't just apply a blanket to everyone and say, that's it, no emails after hours, that'll make everyone feel better. Like you said, horses for courses, and surely the joy of technology in the workplace should be that we're understanding more and more that people have individual ways of working, individual needs. And, you know, the nine to five, it's still around, but for how much longer when we're talking about telecommuting, people being able to work from home very easily and more kind of open workplaces in terms of hours and work structure? Yeah, no, look, I talked to a journo recently on a Sunday and, and I actually said to them, are you working from home or have you come into the office? Because it seemed to me a reasonable choice. And that particular journo told me they'd gone into the office because at home they found too many distractions and that's fine. But for some other people, they might have felt like sitting at home writing some stories, ringing some people to, to talk to those stories about would be a sensible way to do it, even though the kids might come in or there might be some distraction there on TV. So people work differently and some people prefer to go into the office, some people prefer to stay home. Some people like checking emails at night, some people it stresses them out if they do. So it's, it's interesting, but again, I think we're learning as the world is changing so quickly, we're learning how different people work in those environments. I think we are, although, you know, when you get a little bit older, I'm a bit more settled in my way, so chalk me up for someone who doesn't like checking email when I'm at home. <laughs> Sad to admit it. Matthew Dickinson, we'll do this in a fortnight. Thanks for chatting, mate. Sounds great. Thanks, Nick.